Just a couple of other things I wanted to tell you about. the. Um, as is typical in California these days, and I don't want to get into it too much, they keep passing laws that are not only immoral, but absolutely ignorant. And one of those laws was the bathroom bill, we call it, which says that you have to let boys who think they're girls share bathrooms with girls who know they're girls, and vice versa. And it's just typical of the darkness and the stupidity of Sacramento these days. And this was passed by the legislature, and the governor signed it, and will go into, into law on January. Uh, and numbers of us have said, we've got to take a stand somewhere. So a stand was taken. There was the need to collect uh, like 500 and some odd thousand signatures. They collected 620, a little over that, uh, signatures. So it, it appears that it will go on the ballot, uh, and that should put a hold on it. I just encourage you to be praying about it. There is a great way. There's just real evil behind these kinds of things. And so they'll do their best to try to keep it off the ballot. So you might just pray about it. And then if it comes on, we'll talk to you some more about that piece. And we talked a little bit already about the Willises. I just encourage you to be praying for them. They've been going through a great deal together. And then I really pray that you'd be, uh, pray for Monica Bittner's mom. She's here today. And just lots of challenges at her stage of life. We're really good to see you. Tell her hi for me back there, would you? <laughs> and uh, so just pray for, for Monica and all of them as they're dealing with mom. We know what aging issues are like, and we're really trusting that God will give guidance to all of that. And there are so many that are going through one kind of trial or another, and uh, just encourage you to be much in prayer for one another, encourage one another. We had a great time Friday night. If you were here, I'm glad you could come. Uh, the Ragsdales are just very special and dear friends, and they did a nice job of leading us in an evening of celebration. And I'm trying just to get you in the mood for Christmas. And uh, so uh, my Christmas tree has been up now for a number of weeks at our house. And this weekend, my outside lights went out. Up. And the reason I do that is because of what the time was like when Jesus Christ came into the world. And it was darkness far beyond what we're experiencing even right now. And Jesus came into the world as the light of the world to overcome that darkness. And so that's why Christmas is so incredibly special for me. Because it's such a celebration that God is stronger than the darkness that we see all around us. And we want you to celebrate that thought. Well, we're coming, surprisingly enough, to the end of what I thought would be a month or a month and a half long study on end times, and when we finish this, we will have been two full years. And uh, one thing I am encouraged, I suspect you know more about end time studies now than you did when we started. Uh, I suspect there's a number of things that you've learned that you've forgotten over two years, and that's certainly understandable, but I think we've learned some things. And we want to now, over the next few weeks, through the end of the year, try to tie a lot of the loose ends together. Uh, we're going to be mostly in the last two chapters of Revelation, but I'm going to go around in some other places. And today, I want to get to one subject we've not been able to address yet together. And I want us to think about where do Christians go when they die before the rapture? Now, the rapture we've talked about, we'll review that just a tiny bit today, but there is a question, so that if somebody you know dies, or has died, what happened to them? Where did they go? What went on? Well, I love this verse from Ecclesiastes chapter 7, verse 1, I will often use it as a funeral, and it says, the day of one's death is better than the day of one's birth. And you say, how could that possibly be? Now, one thing you need to qualify, and we're going to see this today, that's only true for the Christian. For the non-Christian, it's just the opposite. We'll see that in a minute. But I do not think that most of us, even in this room, really understand what's ahead for the Christian. And I'm, I'm just constantly amazed at how attached we are to everything here. And there is really nothing here that compares to what God says is going to be ours when we're taken into the Lord's presence at death. 
or if we live long enough, the rapture, which we won't die and we'll go to heaven. But the scripture says, for the Christian, the day of my death is better than the day of my birth. I don't know if you're experiencing that yet. I hope this series has helped you a little bit of it. Paul really captured it well in a verse that many of you know from Philippians 1.21. And Paul says, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. I've always loved that verse, even as a young boy. But do you realize the lunacy of that verse? Really? You try to put anything in the blank where Christ appears, and it makes no sense. Let's just think about that for a minute. If you say, for me to live is fame, awful lot of people live for that. To die is to be forgotten. Now, I do lots of funerals. You wouldn't be surprised at that. And I'm always amazed when I do, especially funerals over in Green Hills or at some mortuary somewhere. And I will often, if time permits, walk around and look at some of the close by uh, gravestones and wonder how much people that gravestones are there are being remembered now. now Ruthie and I are still a little surprised uh, about when we go down Western Avenue, especially on holidays how the grave sites are decorated here at Green Hill. It's just, I don't know that I'd say it's ridiculous. I don't think that's probably fair. Because there are people who really want to remember their, their loved ones. And I wouldn't quite do it with the panache they do. But I mean, it's striking. They're trying not to forget those who died. But let me tell you that every one of those people one day will be forgotten. <coughs> You die long enough, people are going to forget you. So no matter how much fame you have, people are going to forget you. I'm always kind of amazed when I walk down the Hollywood Walk of Shame, of pain. <laughs> um, and, and here are these people whose names are there, and people walk all over their names and spit on their names and all kinds of stuff. And I, I worked in Hollywood for a number of years, and I was there often. And it's just amazing to me what a sham that is. If, if you say for me to live is fame, you're going to be forgotten. Well, if, if you want to be rich, you know how sad that is? It means somebody you don't want very much is going to get what you leave behind. <laughs> and I can tell you, because I worked in the Los Angeles Superior Court for a number of years, and one of the things I dealt with was estates and probate and all that. And you cannot imagine horrible things that come out of people, the greed, when somebody dies and leaves something behind. I mean, I wish I had all day to tell you the story, you'd just be aghast. Well, we could go on and on. You put anything in that blank, it doesn't work. But if you say, for me to live is Christ, you can say, to die is gain. And we'll want to explain a little bit what that means. 2 Corinthians 5, 6-8 says, therefore we are always confident. I wonder, I always am intrigued with, and I think you know this by now, words like always, every, all. Those words really grab my attention because we don't usually live there. It says, I'm always confident and know that as long as we are at home in the body, we're away from the Lord. You know what that means? I mean, as long as you're breathing right here on the earth, God's in heaven, you're here. And it's amazing to me how much we really want to stay here. If you think about to be absent from the body is to be present from the Lord, what would keep us here? I think we miss that one a great deal. <clears throat> Scripture talks about heaven being such a remarkable thing. He says, for we live by faith and not by sight. We are confident, I say, and here now notice this with Paul. I would prefer to be away from the body and at home of the Lord. You know what he's saying? He says, I'd rather be dead. Because that's when I am going to eternally be alive. Now, the reason I'm so concerned about this is so, so often when somebody is really sick, we're so desperate to pray that they get well. Now, don't misunderstand. I share that burden. I pray for people that they get well. But do you know that every one of us is going to die? And I'd rather go to be with the Lord sooner rather than later. <laughs> And I think we get that really messed up. Are you following me at all on this one? And I think the world has really caused us to have a, a crazy idea of what this is all about. Now, the question is, what happens when somebody dies? The bodies of the dead in Christ await the resurrection, it says. But the spirit of the believer is immediately, notice these words, consciously, abundantly, 
in the presence of the Lord. Now, Scripture says your body goes into the grave, but your spirit, and I pick these words on purpose, immediately, consciously, abundantly live in the presence of the Lord. Now, I want us to think about this in some detail. We've never talked about it in our series so far, and I'm hoping this will be really helpful to you. 1 Corinthians 15, 53 says, this corruptible, you know what that is? That's your body. You ever feel it? <laughs> now, it's interesting, when you're young, you don't feel it as much, do you? But as we get older, we feel the corruption going on, don't you? The outwardly wasting away. This mortal must put on immortality. In other words, God says there has to be a death for us to be resurrected. Now, there is a term I want to introduce you to today if you don't know it, and, and hopefully this will help you understand. It's called the intermediate state. It's the time between the death and the new heaven, new earth, and the new Jerusalem. In other words, if you were to die right now today, the time between now and the time the Lord returns and the resurrection takes place and your body rises to be joined is called the intermediate state. Now, let me spend some time thinking about this. And one way I think sometimes it's helpful for us to define things is to talk about what it's not. I mean, I find that if you're trying to just take a difficult concept, this is often a good place to start. And the reason I want to start here is there's so much bad teaching about this period. This is not soul sleep. And you'll find whole religious groups that will teach this. And what they say is the soul sleep is the soul of the believer who dies remains unconscious until the resurrection. That's what soul sleep means. That just like the body is in the dead, uh, de uh, the grave, awaiting resurrection, so the soul is also just asleep. And that there is a sense in which they're unconscious. Now, in John 11, 11, they get this a little bit from verses like this. Our friend Lazarus sleeps, but I go that I might awake him out of sleep. So it sounds like there's such a thing as soul sleep, doesn't it? I mean, you can see where they would get that from this. 1 Thessalonians 4, 14 says, For we believe that Jesus died and rose again, and so we believe that God will bring Jesus uh, with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. So that's where this concept of soul sleep comes from. But what I want to make sure is you understand the definition of it. Sleep here is referring to the body, not the spirit. And this is where the confusion comes. Our body is asleep if we die and will be resurrected and reunited to our spirit. But our spirit is fully alive. Now, how do I know that? Matthew 27, 52. And the graves were open and many bodies of the saints which slept arose. What's sleeping here? The body, not the spirit. Christians do not live in an unconscious state after death, and this to me is the most profound evidence of it, because they are actively singing and praising God right now in heaven, Revelation 14, 1-4. What's going on in heaven right now? There are all these unconscious spirits up there? No. Scripture says what's going on in heaven during the intermediate state is praise and worship. They're actively engaged in the presence of the Lord. You get the idea? This is not the sleep of a soul, so that's not it. Now, I want to go to this next one, but I want to set the precedent. And I'd like you to listen very carefully. I'm going to take the Catholic song head on. And I know in this class are people who do not like me. I mean, I've heard this, never to my face, but through the grapevine, because I'm anti-Catholic. I am anti-Catholic, but I want you to understand why I am, and I hope it might deal with some of the offense. And I'd like you to listen real carefully with this, because if you hear what I say, you'll understand me, and then you'll have something to really think about. Now, if you choose to disagree with me, that's your choice. There is no dictatorship around here. You, you can believe whatever you want. But I want you to realize how wrong the Catholics are and how dangerous it is. 
and, and I'm hoping you'll catch this today. We need to spend more time on it, but I wanted to address it very front on so you know what we're dealing with here. If you want to talk to me at any time, you're welcome to. Uh, we can describe these things, talk about these things, even debate these things if you want. But let me hit it here today clearly, because it fits perfectly where we are now, because the Catholic Church teaches a place called purgatory. All right, so we talked about soul sleep is not what should be happening. But the Catholic Church, in varying forms, has taught pur purgatory. At one point, it's what brought the, the Protestant Reformation. Because Martin Luther, who was a Catholic priest, said this is, it, it just is egregious. Because to raise money for the Pope's special projects, he was selling indulgences, which says that you could buy these things and therefore shorten the period that somebody was in purgatory. And that's much of what the Protestant Reformation about was about. But I want you to understand it doctrinally. And I'm hoping if you've been taught this way that you'll open your mind tonight and today and think about it. And you may have to do some study and all that, but this gets really important. The whole idea of purgatory has no basis whatsoever in Scripture. And that's the problem with the Catholic Church. Historically, they started biblically, but like with most religious organizations, they have gone amiss because they put tradition in place of scripture. We can do the same thing. We need to be alert to that. But in this particular case, scripture clearly teaches that there is an absolute perfect righteousness that's necessary to go to heaven. Now the Catholics get this right. There is the understanding that we must be absolutely perfect to go to heaven. And, and this really troubles me because a lot of people say you've got to do the best you can, my good will out, my, my bad, all of that. Scripture says, and we'll see this in a couple of verses here, that there is an absolute standard of God, and he says the only way you're going to get to heaven is you have to be absolutely righteous. Now stick with me because I'll put all these pieces together. Matthew chapter 5, verse 20 and 48. I say to you that unless your righteousness surpasses the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you will in no case enter the kingdom of heaven. That's pretty clear, isn't it? Jesus says you've got to be better than the scribes and Pharisees. And then he goes on in verse 48, and if you read all the verses in between, it gets even better. He says, uh, be as good as you can as your heavenly Father is as good as he can. And what does he say? Be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Now, do you hear the phrase all the time, well, nobody's perfect? Well, you see, that's the problem. If God's standard is that you have to be absolutely perfect to get to heaven, and I could not agree more, nobody's perfect, we have a problem. Right? Now, what do we do with the problem? Well, most people say, well, we rewrite the definition. God doesn't really mean perfect. He means do the best you can. So that's one way around it. Another way around it is to say, no, God really did mean perfect, so now we have to find a way to be perfect. In James chapter 2, verse 10, it says, For whoever keeps the whole law and stumbles at just one point is, great, is guilty of breaking it all. Now, I'm not saying that. God saying that. And you say, that's unfair. Well, take it up with God. <laughs> and see, what we're teaching is that the Bible is the Word of God, and in the Word of God, He's declared what He wants us to know. Now, you can dislike it all you want. You can say, I don't believe that. That's fine. You're staking your eternal destiny on it. And when you get to the end of your life, you're going to be able to say, well, God, I didn't agree with your standard. And he says, okay, here's the result. I'm going to show you the result in a minute. So the issue here is to be able to say, as a, a thinking person, if this is the standard that the Bible teaches God has, what do we do with this? Now, I'm just wondering, is there anybody here with a raised hand would say today you have never, ever, 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 under any circumstances, broken one of God's laws? <laughs> you see, most of us understand that, don't we? We know we're not perfectly righteous. So what do we do with it? 
And that's the issue that is so critical here. In Matthew 19, 20, 26, it says all these, and he's talking about God's law now. This is the young rich man, by the way. He says, I've kept them all. What do I still lack, he asked Jesus. Jesus said, well, if you want to be perfect, there's God's standard, go sell your possessions and give to the poor, and your treasure will be in heaven. Then come follow me. When the young man heard this, he went away sad because he had great wealth. Then Jesus said to his disciples, truly, I tell you, it's hard. The key word there is impossible for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. And again, I tell you, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. When the disciples heard this, they were greatly astonished and said, well, who then can be saved? Now, friends, that's a question you should be asking. If we really understand this standard that everybody has to be perfect to get to heaven, somewhere along the line we have to say, well, what hope do we have? What can we do about this? How do we handle this? Well, Jesus' answer was, he looked at them and said, with men it's impossible, with God all things are possible. Now, this is the thing I want you to see, and this is a verse out of our study I hope you'll never forget, Revelation 21, 27. It says, nothing impure will ever enter it. He's talking about heaven. You catch this? Nothing impure will ever enter it, nor anyone who does what is shameful or deceitful, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. You see, the, play, the problem is we play fast and loose with God's standard. If you take God's standard seriously, which the Catholic Church has done well, then you've got a problem. God's standard is not possible for us to fulfill. So what do we do with it? Well, this is the need of a nature of having a Savior. Do you realize what God has done through Jesus Christ to make it possible for you to go to heaven to purchase your salvation? Romans 8, 1. There is therefore a little condemnation for those who are in... No, you don't like that? All right, well, let me rephrase that. Then there is only one condemnation to them. You don't like that either. It says there is what? No condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So in other words, God has made a way for every one of us who are not perfect to be forgiven and to enter into heaven. And the thing that's so amazing to me, and I know we've got people sitting in this room that fit this category, that you've either ignored or rejected that gift. And that's what it is. I know all kinds of people for all kinds of reasons who said, well, I'm not a Christian because those hypocrites in the church. Well, have a good time in hell when you tell God that answer. I mean, that's just foolhardy. God says, this is true. I have a means by which you can come to heaven. It's a gift. Accept it. What's the deal? You understand how incredibly simple it is? If I admit I have a need and God has provided everything I need for the need, why wouldn't you accept it? Because Satan has given you a damn lie. And dear friends, I can't tell you how that just blows me away. That people would believe Satan's lie when God's statement is so simple. He has a standard. It's perfect. I'm not. Jesus Christ has died on the cross to make it, and if that's the case, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Do you see how simple that is? Now, in Romans 5.19, it says, For just as through the disobedience of the one man, Adam, many were made sinners, so through the obedience of the one man, Christ, many will be made righteous. So how do we deal with God's righteous standard? We're not. God has sent his son, Jesus Christ, so in Christ we can live up to that standard to be made, what's the word? Righteous. Now, this is where the Catholic Church really goes wrong. And dear friends, there is no weaseling out of this. There is no excuse for this. If you try to defend the Catholic Church in this, you are doomed to hell. 
This is really strong stuff. This has nothing to do with tradition. It has nothing to do with styles of worship. It has nothing to do with this. This has to do with biblical truth. That's why I'm being so incredibly adamant about this today. The Catholic Church teaches that justification is an ongoing promise that depends on what you do. That's not what Scripture says. Our justification, our right standing before God, depends on Jesus doing what he did and our trusting it or not. And the real issue is here, did Jesus Christ do it all or only part of it? Oh. Now friends, please understand, this is not a matter of opinion. This is not John attacking the Catholic Church. This is the issue of the truth. Did Jesus Christ die on the cross to pay for all of it? Yes, he did. Now, what purgatory says is Jesus' work was not enough to fully save us. We must earn merit through the sacraments and other good works we do. Now, friends, this is not a matter of opinion. This is not a matter of preference. This is a matter of truth or lie. Either Jesus Christ did what he said he did, he played it, paid it all, or he's a liar. Because you see, what's at issue here is who's telling the truth. It's either that Jesus is telling the truth, or somebody who says purgatory is necessary is telling the truth. It's either all or nothing. Since we know we fall short of perfection, we can't enter heaven. Therefore, purgatory was invented. And what purgatory is, is a place where we are purged. You see where the word purgatory comes from? We are purged from our sins to gain merit that we need to enter heaven through pain and suffering. Now, friends, I want you to realize how ludicrous and awful this is. It's awful in the one sense because it says the only way you can gain heaven is you've got to suffer. That's terrible. But more importantly than that, it's saying Jesus' death on the cross was not enough. And do you realize what that is? That's blasphemy. When you reject justification by faith in Christ, you need to find some other way to get to heaven. And so what the Catholic Church has done is they created purgatory. Now what's really interesting in this is the Catholic Church denies the imputed righteousness of Christ. Now what that means is the righteousness of Christ is put on you fully. And they say it's not sufficient to save sinners in this life. And so they allow sinners to purchase righteousness through purgatory. And you can do it for other people. And I want you to realize I'm, I'm really not trying to be unkind here. I'm just trying to be really blunt. Do you realize how insane that is? That you, an unrighteous person, can somehow buy righteousness for someone else. How do you get that? And why would you need it? Because Jesus Christ died on the cross for everybody. So candles and gifts and prayers and masses for the dead are the way they say you make up for the shortcomings. Now, dear friends, I'm hoping somehow you hear this. This is serious business. So Isaiah 61.10 says, I delight greatly in the Lord. My soul rejoices in my God, for he has clothed me with garments of salvation and arrayed me in a robe of righteousness. Yeah. Now, it's really great. Stu was right on top of me here. <laughs> it's his I have to teach it to the prisoner. <laughs> you see, this is why purgatory is so awful has no basis in scripture, but much more than that, it robs people of the truth of the gospel. Now, if you're offended at that and me saying it, something is wrong with you. I've said this a couple times today, and I know people get offended when I say this, but the issue is, who's telling the truth? And if you want to sit down, I won't beat you up, I promise. But we will go to scripture and we'll look and see what it says. The Catholic Church is unforgivably wrong here. 
Purgatory is not what scripture says, and that's not where people go when they die. I don't think I can say it any more bluntly than that. I hope I've backed it up a little bit so you'll understand. 2 Corinthians 5.21, God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, so that in him you might become the person who goes to purgatory. No, the righteousness of God. Friends, do you realize this is not some little piddly thing between Protestants and Catholics? This is really critical to understand what salvation is about. Either Jesus did it all or he didn't, and if he didn't, he was a liar and you ought to chuck the whole thing. How I desperately pray that somehow or other you'll take what I say and at least wrestle with it. If you hate me and think I'm a jerk afterwards, that's okay, but at least wrestle with it. And then if you can prove to yourself from the word that I'm wrong and the Catholic Church is right, then trust that. And we'll see when we get to Judgment Day who was right and who was wrong. And I feel for you. Philippians 3, 9 says, I consider them my religious works, Paul said, garbage, that I might gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness that comes from the law, that which is faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God, and is based on faith. Dear friends, you don't have to take communion. You don't have to light candles. You don't have to come to church to be saved. You take communion because you love the Lord. You're, there's not saving grace in communion. There's not saving grace in baptism, although it's an act of obedience. And this is what's so critical for us to understand. 2 Timothy 4 8. Now there is in store for me a crown of what? righteousness which the Lord the righteous judge has given me on that day now, I hope you catch this what I'm trying to say to you is anything that says Jesus isn't enough is going to get us in real trouble and when I'm telling you when you die if you know Jesus Christ the Savior you will enter his presence and that's called the intermediate state at the death of the Christian, they go to intermediate heaven, awaiting the judgment seat of Christ and the return of Christ at the end of the tribulation period, and then the millennium starts. So let me help you see this a little bit. The non-Christian goes to the intermediate hell, awaiting the great white throne judgment and eternal hell. Full redemptive promises of God will find their ultimate fulfillment in the new heaven and the new earth, the new Jerusalem, and that's what we're looking forward to. But the question is, what will heaven be like? And there are two answers. The, immediate heaven, or the intermediate heaven will be like one thing, and the eternal heaven will be like something else. In Revelation 21, 1 to 3, it says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them, and they will be their God. Now let me just help you see the steps. Try to summarize this. Some might agree, disagree a little bit with a few of the orders, but let me just kind of make sure you see the steps. You're born like you die. After your death, there is what I'm calling the judgment of faith. And God is determining what did you do with Jesus Christ. And if you receive Jesus Christ as Savior at your death, you will go to intermediate heaven, awaiting the resurrection and the reuniting of your body and your soul together, your spirit together. If you didn't receive Jesus Christ as Savior, Scripture says you will go to the intermediate hell awaiting God's ultimate judgment. So there will be this intermediate heaven or hell. You follow? Sometime after that will come the rapture. And God will come back to get his bride and we will join those who've died. Their bodies will rise first. We will rise with them and together we will experience the first, uh, pardon me, the second resurrection. After that, the judgment seat of Christ will take place in heaven where we will be judged for our works and the rewards. And we looked at that. That's the Bema seat judgment we looked at many, many months ago. Now, depending how you look at the order of things, the tribulation comes next, then the second coming of Christ, 
After that, the millennium, the great white throne judgment, eternal hell, heaven uh, with a new earth in the new Jerusalem. So there's the order. Now some may see the tribulation coming at a different point than I do, but those are the ingredients. Scripture tells us about the rapture in 1 Thessalonians 4, and, and we saw a little of that even this morning with Byron, not a whole lot about it yet, but according to the Lord's word, we tell you that we who are alive and are left until the coming of the Lord will certainly not precede those who die. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first, and after that we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with him in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And we will be with the Lord forever, therefore encourage one another with these words. All right, so that's the rapture. God's going to come and take us back. Now... I think I've told you a little bit, when I was at Westmont, we had a really obnoxious student. Those of you who, who are really Catholic may would put me in that group this morning, I don't know. Uh, but anyway, he was obnoxious about the second coming. And he would constantly criticize everybody. And he was a lazy kind of guy, he didn't do much anyway. So one Sunday, we decided to stage the rapture in the men's dorm at Westmont College. And we worked on this for a long time. We went into the bathrooms and we put our clothes in piles as if it looked like we went right up through them. We turned the showers on, razors running, everything as if it instantly looked like everybody left. And this was a dorm of, of hundreds of men. It was a big dorm. Then we, and he always slept in on Sunday morning. So he was sleeping in. We all went up on the roof, blew this trumpet. <laughs> he woke up and everybody was gone. It was so good. But it, it just betrays to you my fallen nature. And I, I don't know if you've ever had an experience like that. There have been a few times in my life when I was looking for Ruthie and she was nowhere to be found. And I said, Lord, did you leave me behind? <laughs> There's no doubt in my mind that she's going to go, but I do have some doubts about me. At All right, so the rapture's coming. Do you understand? It's great news for us. John 14, 1 to 3. Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My Father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, I would have told you, I'm going to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I'll come back, take you to be with me where I am. And that's what he wants for us. So here we are. The tribulation period itself will last for seven years. We know that for certain. At the end of that uh, tribulation period will be the War of Armageddon, the final war on earth, really, uh, that uh, right before the Lord turns, the second coming. Satan will be defeated. There will be a thousand-year reign. At the end of that thousand years, there will be a final battle with Satan. He will be defeated entirely, completely, forever. And then there will be the new heaven, the new earth, and the new Jerusalem. All right, so that's all that's going to go on. But there's one big question. What difference does it make? And you see, the thing that's so interesting to me, I look at the majority of people in Los Angeles today, and it makes absolutely no difference at all to them. Is he heaven capturing your attention? Is it a pie in the sky by and by? Is it just escape? Are we saying, Lord, why I'm looking for heaven is things are so bad, I just want to get out of here. Are you heavenly minded? Matter of fact, are you so heavenly minded that you are profoundly effective on earth? Now, when I was growing up as a boy, I used to hear all the time the phrase, you're heavenly, so heavenly minded, you're no earthly good. That really is not possible. I'm convinced if we're really heavenly minded, we will profoundly effectively good uh, on the earth. Colossians 3, 1 to 2 puts it this way, keep seeking the things above. You notice the verb tense here? Keep seeking the things above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on things of the earth. Now, what's so amazing to me? Do you know this name, Isaac Asimov? Some of you will recognize him. He's a science fiction writer of some consequence. And he said, quote, I don't believe in an afterlife. So I don't have to spend my whole life fearing hell, or fearing heaven even more. 
For whatever the tortures of hell are, I think the boredom of heaven would be even worse. Now let me tell you this. I'm really convinced that an awful lot of people think heaven is going to be a very boring place. Now where does that come from? Revelation 13, 6. The beast, that's the false leaders in the end times, was given a mouth to utter proud words and blasphemies to exercise his authority for 42 months. That's during the tribulation period. He opened his mouth to blaspheme God. Notice what he said. To slander his name and his dwelling place and those who live in heaven. What is he blaspheming? The whole concept of heaven. You see, there's very little fear of hell today. Matter of fact, I think the average person would define hell as an everlasting beer hall. It's just a jolly good time. Everything good, enjoyable, refreshing, passionate, and life-giving come from God, however. And without him, the scripture says there's nothing. Won't it be boring to be good all the time? Well, you know what that betrays? Praise the understanding of sin. We think that sin is exciting and righteousness is boring. I've been in ministry long enough to tell you it's just the opposite. Sin is destructive. It's empty. Oh, it will be titillating for a time. But righteousness is not boring. Sin doesn't make life interesting. It makes it empty. God is an endless reservoir of wonder, and so is heaven. And the more we understand that, we're going to realize that heaven is going to be just this most unbelievably wonderful place. So is your Christian life boring? Is your worship boring? Well, then that's why you think heaven's going to be boring. Ephesians 3.20 says, God is able to make and do immeasurably more than all we can ask or imagine according to his power that is at work within us. The real question is, how could God not be bored with us? A lot of people say, and I've heard it so many times, I'd rather be having a good time in hell than to be bored in heaven. Let's just talk a minute about what hell's like. Do you have a clear picture? Let me just give you these traits real quickly and then we'll end today. It's a place of abandonment for all of eternity. It's a place of total, eternal absence of God. It's a prison. It's a place of eternal confinement. Helpless, hopeless, powerless, and there is no way out or a relief. It is not a rest in peace place. It's a place of eternal punishment. A third angel followed them and said in a loud voice, if anyone worships the beast and its image and receives its mark on their forehead or on their hand, they too will drink the wine of God's fury, which has been poured in full strength into the cup of his wrath, and they will be tormented with burning sulfur in the presence of holy angels and of the Lamb, and the smoke of their torment will rise forever and ever. There will be no rest for day or night for those who worship the beast and his images, for anyone who receives the mark of the beast or its name. You know what we call that today? We call that hell and fire and damnation sermons. And people mock at it. But it's the truth. For hell is a place of unending sorrow. As the weeds are pulled up and burned in the fire, so it is at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send out his angels and they will weed out of his kingdom everything that causes sin and all who do evil. They will throw them into the fiery furnace where they will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. You know what gnashing of teeth is? It's uncontrollable anger. You literally wind your, grind your teeth down because you're so mad. Hell is a place where the inhabitants are angry about everything. It's a place of un unlenting, unrelenting, conscious, eternal regret. It's the place of unending destruction. It's a place where God's love isn't. There is no fruit of the Spirit there, only the acts of the sinful nature. Look at Galatians 5. There will only be conceit, provoking, and ending one another. And then it's interesting in Ecclesiastes 9.10, it says, There is no activity or planning or knowledge or wisdom in Sheol. Think about that a minute. There is no activity, planning, or knowledge or wisdom in Sheol. You know what that's saying? In hell, nothing's going on. 
It's an eternal boredom. It's a place of darkness, outer darkness, matter of fact. There is no fellowship in hell. Interesting to me that so many people talk about this eternal beer hall kind of thing. It says, God is light and in him there's no darkness of all. If we claim to have fellowship with him, walk in the darkness, we lie and do not live in the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. Heaven will be a place of profound fellowship. Just listen to some of the words that the writers of Scripture use. The place of destruction, punishment, judgment, condemnation, hell, retributive suffering, the gloom of utter darkness, the punishment of eternal fire. Those are the phrases that God uses of heaven. So any belief that hell is boring and hell is fun is evidence of spiritual insanity and delusion. Satan is really good at this. He takes what is right and he makes it wrong. And he takes what is wrong and tries to make it right. And so he makes hell a place that looks attractive and heaven a place that doesn't. And the sad piece of it is people believe is lie. Hell is a place of torment, isolation, and judgment where nothing good resides. On the other hand, Heaven is the place of newness, joy, fascination, and fulfillment. There is no boredom in, in heaven. And I'm going to prove that over the next couple of weeks as we look at some details of that. So Psalm 1611 puts it this way. In your presence is boredom. At your right hand there is nothing but regret. Is that what it says? No, it says, in your presence is the fullness of joy. At your right hand there are pleasures what? Forever more. To believe that heaven is boring is to say that sin is exciting and righteousness is boring, that God himself is boring. It isn't God who's boring. It is us and the satanic lies that we believe. Eden was the picture of perfect rest. Work that was meaningful, enjoyable, abundant food, a beautiful environment, unhindered fellowship with God, one another, and the animals. It was a perfect place. And so scripture tells us, make every enter effort to enter that rust. Come to me, all you who are weary, and I will give you rest. Well, let's put it in song, Kyle. We'll do this quickly. This song really captures the truth of what we're trying to say.
talk to me. And if you want to, don't come and talk to me right now. This is not the place here. I'll be upstairs in the Welcome Center, glad to spend as long a time with you as we might want. We might go up to a quiet room somewhere if we need to. So don't come all rushing at me up here. This is, we gotta get out of the way for the other class. If you don't know Jesus Christ as Savior, friends, when you die, you're going to hell. Now you can deny that if you want to. If you want to take that gamble, you can. But what I'm telling you is the Bible tells you that the only thing that God will allow into heaven is perfect righteousness. And this song just told you, and all that we've been saying this morning, is that Jesus Christ did it all. And it's a free offer. And if you need some help to understand that, we'd be delighted to meet with you. Don't believe Satan's law. If you're confused about any of these things, we'd love to talk with you. I'd be delighted to make an appointment next week to talk with you about it. For you who are Christians, do you realize the day of your death is better than the day of your birth? Amen. Heavenly Father, I always uh, just am so dependent on you in times like this. I have tried today to declare without compromise the truth. And I wouldn't doubt that some are offended. I pray that out of their offense, they would take a real look to say, all right, do, do what, I, uh, what I offended about, is it biblical or not? Because I want us to know the truth, because I know that truth will set us free. I pray for the person who doesn't know you as Savior, they would honestly look at what's here and say, all right, I need to look at this again. For the person who is confused about the intermediate state and all of that, the Lord is really clear in your word, and I pray that you'd help us to be able to proclaim it clearly, helpfully in this place. I thank you for the time we've had this morning. I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.